Before we get to Joris, I would like to see which tribes are out here. As you all know, Joris Luidek is an anthropologist, uh, people who study tribes. So let's see which tribe you think you belong to. Let's start with the first tribe, maybe the banking sector. Who's here from the banking sector? I see one hand. Yeah. What's your name and where do you work? Thomas, but I'm a former banker. Now I'm a, a sustainability consultant. You're sitting next to yours. You should say you're still a banker. Yeah. Uh, who's within renewable energy? That's a big part. Big tribe. Let's see. What's your name? Where do you work? I used to work for Von der Bon. In between jobs now. And, oh, he's looking for a job. All right. Yeah. And your name is? Q. All right. He was looking for a job. Uh, another sector. Uh, electric mobility. EV. It's also renewable energy, but let's just see a bit different. What's your name? Daniel Hoogdijk. Ik ben van Schiedam en ik ben uh, van Nieuw Hippie. Ik begeleid uh, consumentenbedrijven naar uh, elektrisch rijden. Nieuw Hippie, that's a good name. Um, and then let's see oil and gas maybe. No one. Or some. Yes. No, no one, right? Uh, someone who I didn't mention yet, who is from another tribe? Let's see, which tribe, what's your name? Where are you from? Peter de Boergraaf, Amsterdam. Municipality. City, municipality. Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah. Are there municipality people? No? All right. Oh, yeah, you're from a municipality. All right, cool. Welcome all. Um, the, maybe one other tribe to see who's a student. Nice, quite a few students out here as well. Cool. And teachers. Um, what's that? Teachers. Teachers. No, that's right. Are you the only teacher or more? Yeah. Two. Two teachers. Social, nice. enterprises. social enterprises. Good one. Who's working at a social enterprise? Or at social enterprise itself? What's your name and which social enterprise? Uh, Saskia and from Better Places. Better Places. That's in electric mobility or not? No? no? Oh, not really. But oh, it's a oh, better place. That's another one. Sorry, but that's bankrupt. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> uh, welcome all. Uh, we will have an interview with Joris Lauendijk together. So you can ask questions as well. Um, of course, not everyone will be able to ask a question, so brief reminder to keep it short and just a question if it's possible. Um, and then hopefully uh, most people can ask one. Let's move to our guest of today. Born in 1971 in Amsterdam, but he was raised in the old media capital of Holland, which we call Hilversum. Um, during his studies, he meandered a bit. He ended up with religious anthropology, and then in 1995, he moved to Cairo and lived there for a year. Um, and the book, uh, Een Goede Man Slaat Soms Zijn Vrouw, or A Good Husband Sometimes Beats His Wife, was the result of that. The book led to another episode in his life. He became a correspondent within the Middle East for Radio One. He worked for the Volkskrant, NOS, NSA Handelsblad, and then he moved back to Amsterdam in 2003. He became the host of Zomergasten and Wintergasten. Uh, he interviewed people like Naomi Klein, Desmond Tutu, quite special, and then in 2009, NSA Handelsblad asked him to become the correspondent, new journalism and electric mobility. And that was in a year when literally nobody knew of Tesla, but now we all do, so quite soon in the era. 2011, The Guardian asked him to move to London, and he worked for The Guardian to dive into the world, the tribe of bankers. And that book, Dit kan toch niet waar zijn, or the more appealing title, Swimming with Sharks, was the result of that. Please give me a warm welcome, Joris Luidendijk. We've got a book here um, between us. May the student in you never die. What about yourself, Joris? Is the student still alive? Yes, I, I've, I actually worry about this. It's that, it's, uh, that I, I still think that my life is the start. That it's, this is all just a dress here or something. Um, you didn't start yet. No, this is just sort of like playing around. Uh, and so yeah, I still try to live like a student more or less. So I have no fixed uh, job, a um, fast contract. You almost never had a fixed contract, right? No, no, they, they don't want me on their payrolls. <laughs> <laughs> and would you want to? No, <laughs> no, no, because then you have to defend the line of the organization and it's, it's all painful. And most organizations prefer you to be freelance because of uh, tax reasons. Uh, and so we're, we're both very happy. I, I can walk out whenever I want. Uh, and they, they're not burdened by the idea that they'll never get rid of me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. 
And the student also refers for me to a learning curve, to keep learning. And a learning curve is a very important thing in, in your work. Can, can you briefly explain what you refer to as a learning curve? Yeah, it's this idea that, um, that um, most journalism is a, an update on process, and most people don't know what the process is. So there are so they, these are software updates, but you don't have the so software. And you can test this for yourself. You, you've been following, say, the Northern Ireland for 20 years. Now explain what the Protestants are doing there. People have no clue. Um, explain to me the difference between Shia and Sunni Muslims. People have no idea. Uh, what is, how did the whole Palestine-Israel conflict come about? And so you can follow the news for 20, 30 years without actually ever learning anything profound about the world. But you do know that the latest development in that process you don't understand. And so I thought, why don't we, why don't I do journalism, but not what happens today in the news, but what happens every day. And to, to sort of chart my learning curve, start at absolute zero. No, not, so ignorance is bliss, I know nothing. And then every time I learn something, it's, it's sort of this data point on a curve. And so over time, through say columns or sharing my raw material, a learning curve appears. And so if you, it's like taking a course almost. And you share a course, for example, with The Guardian, you share it in a blog, readers can comment, and that yeah. way you build together a learning curve. Yeah, that's the theory. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we will get to that. The, the idea of this session is to have a learning curve together uh, around, let's say, three themes. Uh, we will include electric mobility in it, or the broader thing of the electrification of society. Uh, the second one is uh, the financial crisis. Uh, and the third one is the ecological crisis. So, kind of the aim of the session is to see what in the, oh no, that's another triangle, what's in the triangle um, of those three elements. Um, and we will start with uh, the electric mobility, since that is kind of, um, uh, let's say, a yeah, starting point. But before, just briefly to touch upon that, um, you moved to uh, Cairo, of which the result was this book. Um, and in that period, um, there was sometimes that you referred to uh, oil being a terrible thing for a country to have. Um, what do we see here? Are numbers of Aramco. Aramco is the Saudi Arabia uh, state-owned oil company, and they just recently received, uh, released some numbers about their uh, uh, net profit. So it's not turnover, but it's net profit, uh, net income, um, and they even have more profit than Apple, which we all thought was the biggest company on the planet. So the state-owned company has the biggest net income. Why is it for Saudi Arabia a, uh, a terrible thing to have all this oil? Can you explain that? Well, this is the theory of the resource curse, is that um, if you want to have democracy, it helps to have to raise tax. Because if you raise tax, your citizens are going to be very interested in how you spend that tax. And um, if you have resources, then the, the income is generated through the resources. and so. The state changes in nature entirely. It becomes this, this, uh, yeah, this, you get all these handouts. So the idea of no taxation without representation can be turned on its head. Uh, no representation without taxation. And so since the Saudis don't have to tax their people, their people have very little claim on the Saudi rulers on you know, uh, uh, demanding transparency, participation, all these sort of things. And so when I, when I went to Saudi Arabia, they, they would always say, like, don't compare us to Norway or the Netherlands, two countries that had a functioning democracy when they discovered their fossil fuels. You have to compare it to Venezuela and Nigeria. And essentially what it means is that if you have oil, then it's not just countries that want to buy your oil and want to control the supply of oil. They, they want to make sure that you spend your oil dollars on their industries. And so when people talk about the Iraq war was about oil, it was also about making sure that all, the, all that oil wealth um, in Iraq would be spent on American companies rather than French companies. And this is why the Dutch, for example, well, one reason why the Dutch backed the Iraq war is that we were in line for some really juicy contracts. Too bad it didn't really work out. Then again. Uh, but that's, that's what makes oil, I think, a curse. And so my idea of the electric car uh, was that the biggest favor we could do the Arab world is to stop buying their oil. Yeah. That was, but that was already in 20, uh, 2009. There was like a period in which this was kind of the case. This is a picture on the Kaiserschacht, uh, I think. Uh, we see a Tesla Roadster, one of the early ones, uh, next to uh, not a Saudi Arabian car, but uh, you see the difference, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah it was mostly golf carts in those days, uh, electric cars. How did, and, uh, and how did you get to the point, I'm going to study or investigate electric mobility? 
Well, it was, it was two things. It was push and pull fact. I was trying to get a scholarship for Harvard for a really interesting program, and they turned me down twice. So I got really annoyed. Uh, and I realized that I'd have to do something radical, which may uh, you know, uh, have a t fantastic yield, if you like, or a return. That was so great that it, in retrospect, I would think, oh, I'm so glad Har Harvard turned me down, because otherwise this great thing would have happened. <laughs> and so it's, this is when you know, frustration can be channeled into daring. Um, and so I thought what, what would be really radical is to, I'm going to electrify the Netherlands. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so I, I so I started out at NSA, and they they were deeply uncomfortable. Uh, they had no idea what I wanted, and I said you could never sustain twelve months of columns, so they're around fifty or forty-five, around the subject of a car that isn't even there. Uh, but I I, I thought no, this, this, uh, challenges can be good. You know, if you if you if you give an architect if you tell an architect, okay, you can build anything you like, your budget. There's no limit to your budget. You can use any material. Every architect freezes. But if you tell an architect, okay, you have only this budget and these are the materials and this is, these are all the other constraints, then creativity flourishes. So I like constraints. Um, so I started writing that uh, call. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it bore out. Uh, my go the governing idea was that- You're happy that you didn't end up at Harvard in the end? Yeah, because the electric car, this idea of sharing your learning curve around an electric car, in the end, I had this, uh, set, uh, this conference with Alan Rusbridge, the editor of The Guardian, and it turned out he had an electric car. And so there was finally somebody who had any kind of interest. Uh, and, uh, and then I explained the thinking behind it, that if you want to get people interested in, for example, sustainability, you have to start from a different angle than give them uh, process updates, because it, it just shuts them out. It make, I skip most news about climate change, for example, because either the news is, it's not as bad as you thought, well, then I may have well skipped it, or it's even worse than you think, and then I end up feeling depressed and powerless. So I thought if for sustainability, journalism has to offer this, this uh, agency perspective. Uh, and that might be an electric car where NRC homes, well, if at the end of my curve I decide, okay, electric car is a good idea, then let's start distributing NRC homes with electric cars, and perhaps fundraise it to the readers. And then I was just really unlucky in the sense that NRC uh, was put up for sale. And so for a while, it was absolutely impossible for NRC to do anything like changing its distribution or the nature of the distribution because it may end up in, a, by, in, the, in the same hands as Volkswagen or Telegraph. So that kind of fell flat. I, that I lost the agency perspective. But then Alan Rusbridge came along and he said, I like the idea. Why don't you come over uh, to London and do this project not about electric cars, but about uh, banking? Because that's another subject where people get process updates, yeah. but they don't have the software. Before we move to banking, do you stay involved within electric vehicles, or is it now just mm. something? Well, every now and then, I, I, when I, I come across a really thorough, long article, for example, in the London Review of Books, or New York Review of Books, or the Zeit, or something, then I'll read it. Uh, but these, I, I'm actually uninterested in these process updates. Uh, but yeah, I think once you dive very deep into a subject, you realize that um, you, you can't be halfway in. You're either following it as detailed as possible or not at all. Yeah. In 2010, you, you, you stated two misconceptions about uh, electric mobility. Uh, the first one was electric cars will not get there. And the second one is electric cars will get here fast. Both are not true, you said. Um, is it still the case, you think? Or? I always get really nervous when people quote me back. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just made it up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but then the, the, my so conclusion was, was slightly uh, subtle in the sense that if it's, uh, I think it's electric mobility seemed like a party. So if, if you invite everyone and everyone thinks that everyone else is coming, then everyone is coming and then it's a great party. So it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in that sense. And so it's the same with electric mobility. If were everybody to believe in electric mobility, then the, 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 co the infrastructural costs would come down tremendously. That it'd be, pouring money into research and so it would in the end prove its its own validity yeah. but since so few people believed in it uh, I felt that what we needed was more uh, research and so I set up this uh, jury prize uh, where we gave a uh, quite a lot of money 10,000 euros I think 15,000 to the, the best thesis uh, BA and MA thesis about electric mobility as a kind of stimulus and it worked out quite well. If we, this is not uh, for the Netherlands, this is uh, for the US, but it's kind of similar around the world, what we see happening, is that like selling the first million electric cars takes quite a while, 
and you were probably in that uh, first million. And now you see like the, the time for cars to be sold dropping really quick. Um, do you feel like some kind of pride or do you think like, yeah, I did my share in electric mobility or how does it work for you? No, um, no, it's, I, well, it, it's always nice when things work out the way you uh, thought they would. And I felt that with electric cars, generally electric mobility, there was this coalition of such disparate parties and if one would fall away, you'd still have the other. So there was, there was the nuclear industry, and there was the, the Israelis, a better place. Um, then uh, there was just generally geostrategic goal. Con con uh, countries that want to wean themselves off fossil fuels for geostrategic reasons, for example, China. Um, and then there was climate, then there was uh, air quality. That's a lot of different groups. You know, I always try to imagine the, the demonstration. And so you'd have these green lefties, walking next to hardened Zionists, or walking next to nuclear uh, fanatics. Fantastic uh, multi group of people. Uh, so I felt that's probably going to push it through. Also, because the alternatives, um, I, I, I followed the electric car long enough to realize that uh, hydrogen power people were always pushing the, uh, there was, we were always five years away from the big breakthrough with hydrogen, and, and that just moved with the time. So it's a receding horizon. They kept promising it in five years. So I felt that, that that would be the only thing that, in my mind, could derail uh, electric cars if, the, if something even better came along. Uh, but of course, the jury is still out. I mean, there's a lot of hype around it. And I think with batteries, uh, some things have been solved that I think uh, were, 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 were portrayed earlier as unsolvable or very difficult. I think there's still a lot to be done, and, and you'll have all these unforeseen consequences. Uh, so yeah, most problems start out as a solution to another problem. We will move to the banking sector in a minute, but before we do that, are there questions around electric mobility uh, or electrification of society? Eric, here we go. Um, yeah, I have a question. What would be the, um, uh, I have a Nederlands, what would the best knop be to be now to be faster? So, what, what could accelerate the process? Um, you mean in sort of theoretically or very practically? Practically, uh, well, yeah, I, I, I would think CO two uh, uh, trading, emission trading, that would be the, yeah, that would be the key. I think. Uh, other, other question. We just okay. move along. We well, can do an all hour hour about CO two trading. It's just, what's your name? Thank you. Question. Hello, my question is about electric bikes. Do you think there's going to be a rise in their popularity? You talk a lot about electric cars, but I see definitely electric bikes getting a lot of popularity. How do you think that will? How do you think that will grow? Uh, you know, to, to be honest, yeah, I'm really that there. There are other people here who know so much more about these things. Uh, so the, I took this up ten years ago. So I, I, I can, you know. Uh, you didn't arrive on an electric bike, right? No, I just use my my legs. But I think with, a, with an aging, <laughs> aging society, aging society. Uh, that, that must be very, uh, very appealing. Other questions? No, not yet. Maybe like, oh here, yeah, you're from electric mobility, so. And in the rise of the T Ford, the banking industry played a, a disproportionate role in promoting fossil fuel cars. What can the banking industry do now to promote electric mobility and solve the problem? Um, that, that's a very big question. Um, because the banking industry is very big, as you know. Uh, I think it's, yeah, I don't think they really had a role in torpedoing the CO2 emissions trading scheme. I think that's more the, uh, well, okay. there is of course the, the issue of how to value oil that will have to stay on the ground. So I think there, uh, there the banking industry plays a, a, a crucial role. I think similarly with the Netherlands, if you would begin to take seriously the possibility that nobody will be able to live here in 100 years. That should kind of impact the value of our houses and that sort of thing. So there are, there are many uh, parties involved who do not want to look too far ahead into the future because it will punish them in the present. If you, if you move from, a, let's say, an oil-run society to an electric, all-electric society, what, what kind of hurdles do you see there if we really want to get there? Uh, yeah, a lot, many. Uh, the biggest ones, yeah. I think that you mentioned them earlier, I think you know, vested interest will 
defend their interests. That would make them vested, uh, and so they will they will find ways. And so I think with, for example, um, to, to mobile telephones. PTT was very very bad at building something up, and ultimately, the incumbents just bought the new the new players. Um, I think with the internet, we're seeing that the new players are buying the what's left of the incumbents. So it could work two ways. But it's, yeah, I, I just really don't have the, the insight to make it interesting for people who, who study this stuff every day. Okay. Let's move to the topic you studied for a while, uh, really intensely. Uh, who has read this book, either in the Dutch version or the English version? Oh, that's the majority. <coughs> cool. Um, there's, there's a quote on page 70. Maybe people think, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. I don't know, that's the quote. I would like to just phrase here, because it really triggered me. It's a quote about um, uh, a banker who used to work in the banking industry in, let's say, the 70s and the 80s as well. Uh, and then the system was different, so the system of ownership was different. Um, and uh, he, he like, thought of a new product, like a really smart guy, he thought of a new product, got to his chief and asked him if he should introduce that product. And then uh, his chief responded, this is my money you're fucking with. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you link that um, to, let's say, the ecological uh, reality, we only have to change like two words in it, and we get to, yeah, this is our planet you're fucking with. Yeah, and, and the problem, I think the problem is quite similar, is that uh, y you can, you can uh, the, these comp companies are owned by shareholders who have limited liability. And so the, the quote is from somebody who was explaining about the, the old partnership model in banking, where the risky bit of banking was done in partnerships, and partnerships means owners and managers are one and the same. They're uh, personally liable, meaning that nobody will suffer more from uh, the bank going bust than they. Uh, and it's quite similar to the system, the system of names with Lloyds. And if you go to the south of England, you go to villages, and people can just point to all the houses where men killed themselves after they were ruined, because they were personally liable for losses they, they could never cough up, and then the honorable thing to do was to kill yourself. Um, I'm not really calling for that model <laughs> to, to come back, uh, but it's, it, it, it is in, in, you know, in, in very stark terms just how different it is from what we have now, where these partnerships are either bought up or went public themselves, so they were listed on, on, on the stock exchange, and then so they went from full personal liability to limited liability. And so suddenly the people up there, they were no longer playing with their own money, they were playing with other people's money. And the damage they caused to society could, could never be um, the shareholders could never be uh, held accountable for them, uh, held liable. And that's, of course, very similar to, sh to, to Shell. We'll never be able to, uh, even if we come up with a number of all the damage Shell has done to the, to the planet, the shareholders will come up, worst case scenario, that they, they lose what they paid for their shares. Well, that's a, that's a in, in Germany, there's a, there's a beautiful book uh, called Strukturierte Verantwortungslosigkeit. Uh, leave, leave it to the Germans. Uh, to come up with a word like that. Uh, and it's a fantastic term, so verantwortungslosigkeit. Uh, so it's, 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 it's this, this system whereby no, nobody is, is finally responsible. And that you find it in, in, in banking too, that bankers point to the shareholders, the shareholders say, well, they, I, I, I own so many shares and, and I have very little influence, and, and then they refer to the pension funds, and the pension funds refer to the credit rating agencies. They've, they've sort of you know, made final responsibility disappear. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the founder of capitalism, uh, Adam Smith, always said, you know, the invisible hand works provided there's full personal liability. That's always the bit that bankers like to forget. They like the invisible hand because you can't prove its existence. Uh, and, but they really don't like the personal liability bit. Do you see that coming back? No. No, and the reason is that they, if you, uh, if you're going to be personally liable for a bank that operates in 180 countries, nobody will want to run a bank that runs in 180 countries because there's no meaningful way that you'll be able to make sure that in all these countries uh, there isn't something that could you know, uh, send you to jail. I think it, it would, and you're going to have to find some sort of way of making sure that nobody suffers more from a bank going bust than the bankers themselves. Uh, and so I'm sure that if we introduce some sort of personal liability, Banks will be less likely to say go on this buying spree. You know, buy a bank in Mexico, you'll think twice. Colombia, you'll think twice about money laundering and that sort of thing. Uh, but the system we currently have is just yeah. You, you, if things go well, you get a fantastic reward. You buy an extra house. Things go wrong. Somebody else has to sell their house. 
that's you know, it's perverse incentives. You can explain this to an eight-year-old. Any questions on this topic or related? What's your name and what's the question? Uh, my name is Matthijs. Um, I have a question. You say there's nothing there to change the liability things, but the blockchain and smart contracts True. could, of course, change that whole perspective. What, what are your thoughts on that? True. Yeah, so, so if, you, if you take banks as they are, I don't see how you could reintroduce uh, personal liability. Um, as for blockchain, uh, I'm still just in awe. I mean, I haven't worked out the position. Uh, it's, it's, it's the only thing that was really helpful was that somebody explained why it's so it, it, difficult to explain. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that if you, if the blockchain, as it was explained to me, is that you can basically address everybody in a room that has seven billion people in it. And so, so intuitively, that's unthinkable. You think a, a number of people, and then they're standing there, and the other people are behind them. But they're not. They're all in this circle. And that, that goes for everyone. And that's, again, so difficult for human beings to visualize. And that's also when I, uh, where I uh, throw up my hands. And so I was, I was, I think, probably one of the last researchers to go into finance before this whole blockchain would completely outdate all our research. <laughs> it's a bit like the Arab Spring that killed my other book. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, Jasper, uh, my question is, you explained very well what the uh, system change should be, for example, in the financial world, to avoid future financial crisis. You also say CO2 uh, emissions pricing would be a systemic change to avoid climate crisis. If it's that easy to explain, how do you explain the complacency, maybe, or inaction of 95% of the society not asking for these system changes? How is that possible? Well, uh, well we seem to be in this, this terrifying lab experiment where we're testing just how long people can stay in denial collectively. And so far, the results suggest pretty long. Um, and so I think what teach, this teaches us is there must have, there must be there must have been an evolutionary advantage to staying in denial, or those people who stay in denial for so long would not have made it to the present. Uh, and that means that this must be something very deep seated, that apparently through evolution, when you were thinking long term, you had fewer chances to survive than if you were thinking short term. So if you just went out and slaughtered as many buffaloes as you could, you had a better chance of survival than when you were sitting down thinking, but what about next season? How will the buffaloes do? So you and I are the anomaly. You know, you shouldn't have gone through evolution because you're thinking long term. <laughs> and so the, yeah, usually human beings change uh, Churchill, Churchill has said, you know, you can count on the Americans to do the right thing. They just have to exhaust all the other alternatives. And I think that's, that's probably true for human beings as well. They, they're just running through the alternatives to action. It's the same with finance. It says, it's as long as it's possible to save the current system, they will do it. It's only under extreme pressure that people change. It's similar with smoking or relationships. or When people see any other way of avoiding Immediate pain, they'll go for it, and there must there must be some evolutionary reward. So we need an apocalypse. Yeah. Well, that that's that's the thing. Have we built something? So we need a shock to the system, but have we built something that is uh, that will go down with the shock? So are we still shockable, if you like? And with finance, and I'm, uh, there's now this fantastic documentary out that's about to go uh, hit the cinemas, uh, the eighth day, the achtste dag, uh, about. Ten years ago, Lehman Brothers, September 15, and why haven't we fixed the problem? Um, and that also goes goes back to this: is that when the system began to wobble, it looked like the entire financial system would crash, and that would mean that uh, distribution or, or supplies to supermarkets, uh, petrol stations, pharmacies would all stop. Um, and so, in despair, basically, we we guaranteed all debts that the financial system had, and that stabilized it. Um, we just could not sustain the shock of Lehman going bust and then all the other banks that had lent too much to Lehman going bust and then the banks going bust that had lent too much to the banks that had lent too much to Lehman. Yeah. It would just be a domino and, and you think, will, for example, democracy survive such a 
disaster. And so we decided to, to bail the system out. Uh, but that meant that there was no political capital uh, to take on the banks afterwards, because there's almost no awareness of just how close we were to what kind of abyss uh, 10 years ago. And that seems with climate too. You know, you, it's, 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 I think we must pray for a shock and a catastrophe, an apocalypse, that is a, sort of a medium-sized apocalypse, that is big enough to wake people up, but not so big that there are no more people to wake up. <laughs> there's quite a scary movement in, in the scene of people who are really wealthy and who see that risk coming. It's called preppers. I don't know if anybody knows about it. Yeah. 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 Uh, and one of the things I came across is the Survival Condo Project, um, which you see an image of here. It's basically a hideout for the very rich to, to get away from this medium or maybe high impact apocalypse uh, to be safe and just wait a while and have some protection and then see what happens next. Yeah. The Amitav Ghosh, uh, the, the Indian writer, also believes that, that Trump definitely and, and his crowd definitely are convinced uh, of climate change. It's just that they, they don't feel responsibility or they don't feel capable of changing it. And so let it just play out, you know, have a bit of Darwinian fun. Hmm. Any questions on that? Yeah, I get to you. What's your name and what's the question? Uh, my name is Ina. I was reading the newspaper this morning that the, uh, the ING Bank who wanted to give a 50% raise to someone and um, they didn't do it in the end. Uh, what surprised me this morning was that uh, even the shareholders seem to have a bit of a conscience saying you can't do this. And I think uh, the other option now was just um, giving the 50% raise but doing it short in little, little rounds, not 50%. But the, um, the mumbling, the, the, the shareholders that were not happy uh, seem to somewhat contradict what you say now. I think because, um, could it be that there's also a softer option that, that we, we do get a conscience even shareholders? That we don't, don't need a big, you don't like the apocalypse story, so if there, is there no, another no, option no, out? It's not necessary, no, please, no. But, uh, <laughs> is there another option out? Could it be that shareholders, maybe due to Trump, I don't know, uh, no. get a conscience? No. No? <laughs> no, it's the same with shoppers. No. You, you poll people and they tell you all the right, they give you all the right, make all the right noises. And then you look at what they buy and they don't. And so maybe at the the lokale afdeling van D66 in Baat Gaasmeer, there is this turnaround. Uh, but I don't see, maybe I've spent too much time in London. Uh, the influx, so cynical. The influx, yeah. the influx of, of Chinese, Russians, there's, there's zero awareness of all this. Um, and so also, when, when, the thing is, if you, if you grow up in a democracy, you're used to the rule of law. So you think that um, you don't need to grab whatever you can because it can be taken away from you at any time. If you grow up in a dictatorship, that's reality. And so when you have your hands on some sort of privilege, you, you, just, you just go for it. Because everything is, a dictatorship is inherently short term, it's because there's no rule of law, there's no let's say credit. And right now, the vast increase in population is in countries that are dictatorships. And so it, you can call me cynical, but I, I would then call it, I, 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 I really yeah. don't like it, but I would call you delusional. Well, and so we can, we, can trade, we can trade insults, but it's, it's quite useless. I think what, what we need is to arrive at, a, at, a, at an hypothesis of what's going on in order to see what the options are. And we don't need the labels. And other, other options then? Do you see any other option besides the medium apocalypse? Well, my, my favorite, because I'm always told by organizers to end on a happy note, because usually there's a drink, there drinks afterwards. Um, and then, you know, people die in car crashes, right, because they drink too much. And so, so, my, so I had to come, with, come up with uh, some optimism, uh, which is very hard, but I found it. Uh, which is, um, I think, uh, women's, women's liberation. And so the, I think that the, the, the change required in people's mindset around ecology, um, also finance, but primarily ecology, is comparable to the change that was required around women's liberation. Uh, two, I studied, in, I did field work in Egypt two, uh, in 1995, the uh, a good man sometimes beats his wife. That was told to me by women who said that they vowed that they would never marry a man who would never beat them. Now, of course, it's terrible to be beaten, but if you never get beaten, then your husband is just this cold-blooded, 
littered like Westerner, who's probably also an awful lover. So they had internalized a kind of patriarchal, self-blaming mindset. Um, and that must have been what Europe was like 200 years ago. And we made that switch really incredibly quickly. And of course, we're definitely not there yet. Uh, but if, 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 you, if you'd go back 200 years and you tell people where we are right now, uh, they would, they would they, no way they'd believe you. So I, I would say that if we can make that change, also around gay, uh, uh, gay liberation, um, then that certainly there's still hope. Um, it's just right now I think we're in this, with, with women's liberation, liberation there was a lot of work done by people who were just dogged, who just kept, kept at it. And then in 1917, something quite unrelated to, to all this happened. Uh, in 1914, World War, World War uh, One started. All the men were packed off to the front. It was a new kind of war. Suddenly, there were hardly any men left. And women stepped into the void, and they began to run society. And they discovered, to their own amazement, that actually they did rather well. Um, and so when the men came back, those that survived, they, you could never go back to the old situation. And suddenly you see uh, uh, the women's right to vote pop up everywhere. And so a lot of change happens like this. You've got the pioneers, and they just and just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it, and at some point there'll be an opening. And I think the key is not to despair until the opening comes, and when the opening comes, to really seize it. And I think we're now waiting for that opening, and just, you know, that, that's why I, th I still think the, the Afdeling D66, the Vaatgaas Meer, does useful work, because they are pioneering, and they're, they're, they're signaling to society there is a problem, they're working on solutions, they're trying stuff, they, 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 learn, they learn things, uh, so it's extremely useful, but, but I think there's a danger in hoping for some quick magical uh, uh, change in mentality, because that's, that's very rare for people to change, to, uh, for their mentalities to change without any kind of real push. Other questions? That's it for you. Your main question. Yeah, I am uh, wondering in a positive note if it would be possible to have a different kind of uh, governance of uh, uh, companies, like for instance where clients become the shareholders and what you think about it? There's some, there's some really interesting uh, thinking being done also by John Kay, the financial commentator, about why do we still have stock exchanges. Uh, because stock exchanges really date from the time uh, when there were still interest rates. We no longer have these. And most, com most uh, companies that now go public don't do so in order to raise funds in order to invest, but simply for the for the founders to cash in. Uh, and so we, could we think of a completely different model? And, and I think I find that very appealing also because so many of the distortions today stem from the stock market and the need to keep that, that, uh, uh, that, that stock price high. For example, the fact that we, we, we don't have that honest debate uh, and that measures about surveillance is because there are now so many vested interests around keeping the stock price of Alphabet and Apple and so on high. So that it has an immensely distorting effect on society that in the past I think was outweighed by the benefits, but we're now in such a different world uh, that we may not need these stock exchanges. And, and that could really change. Cool. I saw a question in the back as well. Yeah, I'll get to you, if it's possible. Yes, definitely. Let's get here a little bit of Jim. You go with your name and question. Hello, Oleg is my name. Uh, Hello, Joris. Um, I have a question. So you have been um, investigating quite a lot of things. So you're investigating electric cars, you're investigating uh, countries, you're investigating banks. While investigating, you found out a lot of things about them and also a lot of possible solutions. You have written books about them, you told everybody about them, everybody's listening to you. And then they continue doing their normal things. Isn't this super frustrating for you that everybody apparently knows all these things, but they're not acting on it? How are you? How do you cope with that yourself? Well, it's the last thing I investigated was a bubble, uh, bubbles, and I think it's it's very tempting to think that because in your own bubble, everybody's saying the same thing, that surely in society at large, uh, people must be thinking this way. And and uh, I I I would love for you to be right that <laughs> everybody's listening to me. Uh, but even if you write the best sold book of the year, as I, I did in 2015, you sell 300,000 copies, which is less than 2% of the population. And it is worth spending a full day, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just give you a full evening, 6 o'clock till 12 o'clock, with only toilet breaks, 
and watch SBSS, including the commercials. Because there's, there's, I think there's such a tendency on the part of uh, you know, the people I, I deeply uh, sympathize with, you, the, the eco warriors, to think that just because in their own little bubble everybody now gets it, then surely that bubble must really be the rest of the world, and it's not. Uh, and, and so sometimes I go to uh, cor corporations to give a talk or something, and even there, quite high up, there's almost no true awareness or true realization. So does it lead to frustration for yourself? Oh, right. The, 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 my own feelings. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know this is this is this is my job. You know, when we sort this out, I'll move to the other. And uh, this is you know we I'm no frustration. It's yeah, but but life is frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just an experiment. You didn't start yet, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe that's how I protect myself. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> you you're a father as well. How is that? that these things happening around you, eco-warriors shouting out in the, in the desert, do you worry about your kids or is it also something you just black out? I don't think about it. I think as, as most parents do, you, I black it out. Uh, yeah. yeah. Is that for the audience, who's a parent? Let's raise your hand, parents. And keep your hand up if you just shut it out. Oh, I see one hand going down. That's interesting. <laughs> you don't shut it out. What do you do? I'm a life coach. Ah. So you're the optimistic side. I think so. I've got a lot of uh, trust in the coming generation. Yeah. What about you, yours? Do you have trust in the coming generation? In your own kids? I'm, I'm not sure if this, this generational, I think this gener the generational perspective on people is really characteristic of a particular generation. <laughs> so the, the 68 crowd, who decided, you know, because there were so many of them, that they should run society. And they really built this idea up that that generation is what defines you. And I always find it's, it's temperament. And you find temperaments everywhere. So, I, so I, I'd be more inclined to think, are those with this, this temperament most suitable to sort the problems out more or less likely to come, in, come to a position of power? And I don't know. I think technology is this, this tremendous disruptor and enabler. It seems to bring to the fore people like Zuckerberg, who I think is certainly not evil, but I think is delusional. It's, 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 it seems that certain aspects of reality are beyond his cognitive horizon. And I think quite a few of the tech crowd, the, the Googles, and the, they, they really seem to have externalized evil, to think that other, other people's mu people must be the problem, not us. So they don't make me very feel very optimistic. Uh, but it's you know I remember when I was growing up that they were that they were the the patat generatie, the, the the crisps crisps generation we were called, <laughs> and look how great we are. We turned out, so. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Name and question. Hi, my name is Patrick. Um, I have a question. Is the solution now that um, the clean technology is getting so cheap that it will be cheaper than running the fossil fuels? Yeah, I, I imagine that the, 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 you could think of a tech fix, a techno fix. Yeah. Um, I do wonder though whether that, and you know, as most the most problems start as a solution. I think there there are so many unforeseen consequences to the possibility that you could basically have free energy anywhere in the world. Uh, what that would mean, for example, for to nature reserves, I shiver to think. Um, so it's I think it's I I. I, I do think it's, we need an, uh, an ethical, moral mind change. And, and it, we're very unlucky to arrive in this climate change, climate era, just when neoliberalism is at its peak. And neoliberalism's central promise is that systems are self correcting. You don't need morality. Uh, and so it all, all we need is just, you know, transparency and a good judicial system. And so if everybody just pursues their own self interest within the law, Market forces will take over, the invisible hand will take care of it, the outcome is stable, fair, and, and, um, uh, and um, optimal. And 2008 just saw that theory just crash into the wall, except there was nothing, the universities had been neoliberalized, the media had been neoliberalized, that was, it's, it's called the strange undeath of neoliberalism. It's very clear that we need a, a deep sense of morality, but it's almost unconceivable how that would come about. So clean, sustainable energy is not enough, although 
in, in the Arab world, which you know, for roughly that's happening like throughout there. It's like big solar parks popping up everywhere. Yeah. But isn't that hopeful? Or is yeah. It, well, if you don't, you know, I don't want to talk people down, but if you want to uh, just, if, if uh, clean energy becomes next to free, what it will do to the, these societies, there are 300 million people who live off fossil fuels and they live around the corner from us. And so there, in Egypt alone, there are around 90 million people, they don't even know for sure, uh, on an area the size of the Netherlands. Uh, and essentially it's foreign remittances that keeps the place going. Uh, and most of those foreign remittances are related to fossil fuels. Uh, the Gulf is in, almost entirely goes to fossil fuels, so it's fantastic. But that is actually a threat for us. Immensely. It's an immense threat. If, if, the, if the Arab world no longer has oil revenues, that thing will just come crashing down. And I studied in Egypt for a year at the University of Cairo. And the, the problem there is, pe is not that people are unemployed, they're unemployable. They have, they have been taught almost nothing. And that makes sense because the, the dictatorship, the last thing you want is for people to become critical and creative because they may come up with an alternative to you as the dictator. And so we're in the age of robotization. So you have these unemployable people whose skills will be sub are now being superseded as we speak by robots. So they are economically useless, to, 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 to say it in very callous terms. And they're in a society that, if we pull off the whole climate thing, will collapse because there are no revenues of uh, fossil fuels. So if, if you think that um, where, where, you know, uh, that there's nothing else to write a book about. <laughs> uh, other questions, please raise your hand if you've got a question that you need to be answered, otherwise you cannot sleep tonight. So we know that's one, two, that's three, raising the bar. three, four. Let's start here. Ik stel deze even in het Nederlands als het mag. Ja? Joris wil translate. Ik uh, ben een boek aan het lezen van Naomi Klein, dat heet No Time. En wat zij eigenlijk zegt is dat de Wereldhandelsorganisatie wetten heeft opgesteld die eigenlijk contraproductief zijn als het gaat om duurzaam ondernemen. En dat dat dus eigenlijk de reden is dat, dat landen vastzitten, dat ze eigenlijk niet eens kunnen, ook al zouden ze willen. Wat vind je daarvan? Ja, yeah, so the, the question is about the World Trade Organization and they've that there are also some clauses and the World Trade Organization effectively governs global trade and there are all these clauses that prevent countries from adopting um, uh, more ecologically sustainable measures and also gives them the opportunity to knock down each other's sustainability pro uh, projects, uh, which also happens. Um, and I think this is, this is one more example of this neoliberal promise that all we need is just laws and, and then everybody will pursue their own self-interest and we're fine. We don't need morality. Um, and so this is the WTO is a, is a fundamentally undemocratic organization uh, because these essential decisions are taken on a plane where ordinary citizens have, have almost no influence and their elected officials have, have almost no influence either. Uh, and so this is the, yeah, this is the, big, the, that's the thing I hit on with the banking book is that we have had global, global, uh, economic globalization but no political globalization and that has made corporations more powerful than democratically elected governments. Universal morality is lacking. Yeah, it's, it's, well, I don't even want a world government. I think, it, A, that, would, that world, world government would, would not be democratic. The Chinese are not going to give the right to vote to Chinese uh, when they don't give it on the national level. Um, and then, what would that be? I mean, what would the opposition to a world government be? Let's move to the next question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have three left. Uh, one here. Yeah. Name and question. Sorry. Um, yeah. So I would just want to point back to the whole process and on morality because uh, I recently read a book and saw a TED talk by Kate Radford, who wrote a book on donut econ economy, and because she said we have to move away from capitalism at all. And what's your point of that? Do you even think there that we can fix climate change within the capitalist system? Well, I think people mean very different things uh, with capitalism. You know, there's capitalism, the theory, just like socialism. There's capitalism, the theory, and then there's the really, re really existing capitalism. So many people would claim that the crash of 2008 showed the, uh, the deficits uh, of capitalism. But you might as well argue that it showed that capitalism works because they no longer have capitalism in the financial sector. And so I think capitalism is this, this idea that you do not plan centrally, but you leave it to forces that are governed by a set of laws. 
Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's, 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 it's a quite deep, almost religious uh, divide, whether you think that fundamentally reality needs to be planned or can be left to the, these, these opposing forces. Um, and so I, I think then the question is, if you, if you like the theory of capitalism, will you ever get there from the rea really existing capitalism? Because the really existing capitalism is really a bunch of oligopolies. And so there's market failure. In an oligopoly, you don't compete. So there's excess profit, and you use the excess profit to, uh, to uh, defend and protect your oligopoly. It's really like a drug cartel. Um, and so, so they will never, the, the actually existing capitalist organizations will never allow you to introduce actual capital, uh, real, real capitalism. You know, as I say, economists love competition, Corporate, corporates hate competition. So at this moment, we cannot even know whether capitalism will work because it's not there. Yeah, it's a bit like Brexit, in that sense. It's, uh, <laughs> and so when, when it doesn't work, you can always claim, well, we need more Brexit. <laughs> Just like we need more EU. A, so two questions left. One at the back. Who was there? Who was, yeah. Yeah. This is a challenge. Here we go. Yeah, so I want, uh, my name is Willa, and I just wanted to know, uh, you're not investigated as much in the financial sector anymore? No. Okay. So you can't really tell us that uh, you have the feeling we're, we're going towards another um, crisis or not? Well, the thing is that the, the essence of capitalism is crisis. I think crisis is what are what makes capitalism great, in the, uh, at least uh, in theory, because a crisis forces the worst run uh, co uh, co uh, companies out of business, which is very difficult to do in planning in planned economies to get rid of the worst performing businesses. Uh, there's a difference though between a crisis in say the pig farming uh, and a crisis in the financial sector because the financial sector is the infrastructure in which the capitalist system is meant to work. Uh, and and then there's a divide. There are those who claim that uh, the crash of 2008 was the problem, and so they've put in all this regulation to avoid a, a repeat. Like, like generals <coughs> trying to win the last war. And there are those who say, no, 2008 was not a problem, it was the symptom of a problem. And so if you're simply trying to prevent the reoccurrence of the symptom, then they will just have a new symptom. It, and again, it will come from a completely unforeseen black swan event kind of uh, uh, corner. Do you see that coming? Or I mean, um, will I, that come? I think most people I've interviewed, um, and Jean-Claude Trichet, who's in the, the documentary I just mentioned, uh, is a moment. Um, believe that the fundamental underlying DNA has not been fixed. The, an the animal is still the same, which is now in a cage, but the animal has very strong teeth and it pays the keeper. And so ultimately the keeper is going to say, okay, I'll let you out, Donald Trump has just effectively done so. Uh, and so there's a whole cottage, cottage industry in pr pr uh, predicting the next financial crash. As of course, if you just keep on shooting, at some point the bird comes down and you're a great hunter. Um, but I think what, what made 2008 so terrifying is that nobody saw it coming. Uh, and, and again, everybody, you know, okay, so there was the black swan, and nobody, every, everybody thinks swans are white, now there's a black swan, nobody saw it coming. And now everyone's looking for a black swan. The, but the essence of a black swan is next time it will be a pink potato. <laughs> it, it, it cannot be cognitively foreseen. And so I, I think, it, it, yeah, I, I'm with the, the team that believes that, that at its deepest level, what caused the crash was that nobody gave a damn. And add to that new technology, and the savings club, and a few other things, and regulation that's always uh, behind on technology. And then people would just think, okay, so it's, if it's not against the law, it must be allowed by the law. And if it brings in money, then shareholders will be happy, and I get a cut, and so there we go. <coughs> this is why nobody went to jail after 2008 almost, because he didn't even have to break the law to destroy the system. You so yes, I think we're, we're heading for a new one. You're a religious anthropologist, right? It, it almost sounds like we need another religion, or a new religion. Yeah, although every religion, religious anthropologist will probably say, that we already have one, they just, the, today's religions don't come by that name. But a, a religion is a, 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 structuring, a framework that structures experience. Um, and so if you're a humanist, or if you're a consu consumerism, has, has many of the characteristics of a religion. It just, it just has, you know, brought the utopia forward. It has taken it away from the afterlife in the present life. And that's why in consumerism, people are terrified of age. Because that brings us closer to the, yeah, the end, darkness. There's nothing there. 
So it has to be present, and people have to be young. Uh, so yeah, we've never done away with religion. Just generally, 95% uh, of the world population is religious. It's just this little little corner, this Gallic village in northwestern Europe, where people became atheists, and then they imagined that they were at the forefront of this fantastic. Everyone was on their way to become Dutch. And we were the guiding nation. We were the Hitsland. <laughs> Right. Let's, uh, let's see the, the person with the last question. It's quite a challenge because we're now like quite getting to the depressive state, but we might end up positive. I'm, I'm going to challenge you, uh, Joost, to end on a positive note. Uh, we live in a bubble, and in our bubble, as a mission-driven company, we're trying to power lives with sunshine. But we're selling like mad. Everybody is powering their lives with sunshine, their electric cars with solar panels, etc. I've never managed to watch six minutes or six seconds uh, looking at SBS 6. So I'm going to take advantage of this chance. Can you give us a tip? How do we enter uh, the SBS 6 bubble to actually make solar go mainstream? Yeah. How do we reach these people? Yeah. How do we reach these people? Um, I, I think it's a, it's a, and I'm, I'm going to end on a positive thing. It has it's, to be positive. It's a lost cause. <laughs> <laughs> And so, it, but go back to the women's liberation. If you had waited, if you had waited to reach the SBS, SBSS equivalent watch uh, viewer 120 years ago, you could have, we'd still be waiting for the women's right to vote. And there are points when you just have to accept that just because you like participation doesn't mean that everybody else likes participation. Just because you are politically interested, everybody else is politically interested. And I, I did this. Uh, interview project with uh, SBS voters, you know, many of whom vote pay for pay, and they go, you know, if I if I worked all day in a supermarket, uh, I worked very hard. The last thing I want is in the evening to study energy transition. Sort it out. You know, you go to my supermarket. I make sure that you can buy what you want. You are in charge of energy. Sort it out. And s the difficulty, of course, is that they then vote for a party that makes it impossible for us to sort it out. <laughs> <coughs> And, but I think that ultimately, when, when that shock happens, and I'll, I'll make sure it's just harsh enough, um, that they will, they will then see, and then we must be ready. So I think, and a bubble, a bubble now has a very negative connotation, but it is, a bubble also is protected, <coughs> but it is useful. There must also be evolutionary advantage to being in a bubble. It is, it is also helpful not constantly to have to watch SBSS and talk to these people, and they're ignorant and cynical and stupid, and they, don't even, they, they hate you for trying to save them essentially, um, and to just leave them aside, and ultimately they'll benefit. And so, uh, yeah. But so how do you then sell solar panels to them? Well, you don't sell it to them. You just sell it to the, 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 the corporations, housing corporations that own their home. Perfect. Nice. <laughs> Easy. <laughs>